welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Three Principles Global Community webinar. The Three Pr Principles Global Community, or 3PGC, is a nonprofit organization that's committed to bringing an understanding of the three principles to people throughout the world. And if you're not already a member and you're not receiving our newsletters recently, um, please go to 3pgc.org and sign up as a member. It's free, and then you'll learn about these webinars in real time. So, today we have with us Erica Bugby. Um, and Erica is a partner at Pransky & Associates and co-creator of the company's online learning division. Pransky & Associates is a consulting practice outside of Seattle, Washington, that offers professional training for practitioners and coaches, leadership and organizational development programs, and online courses designed for individuals, couples, and families. Erica's parents are both longtime teachers of the three principles, and she learned them formally for herself as a teenager at 13, which is phenomenal. She has a master's degree in psychology and joined Pransky and Associates in 1999. Erica is married and has two kids. So Erica, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to you, and whenever you're ready to take questions, just let us know and, and people can unmute themselves. For anybody on live, if you don't know how to do that, in the, if you roll your cursor to the lower left-hand corner of the screen, there's a little microphone and you can um, unmute yourself and ask questions when Eric is ready. So thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you, Bonnie, so much for setting this up. Um, this, the, you know, the, the, the reason that I, I picked this topic, the, the power of free will, um, our ability to, to let change happen versus making it happen, um, I, I picked that because there are so many people that I come across, um, especially in these conferences, the three PGC conferences, and where people are, or past clients who are, have caught on that, that, you know, their mind is, is the one causing all of the trouble for them. And they've seen it in one area, but they shine the light over in some other department of their lives and they can't seem to you make it work over there and it looks like that area doesn't apply and so people have this idea that there's um that you know that sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't and um it's like this um friend of ours one of my friends from high school is a cop and um he's always joking around about how people talk about you know cops are never there when you need them and and in a way that's that's kind of how i think people feel about the principles you know I got this insight, it was amazing, but where I really need it, it's not like helping me. And maybe that's an area that doesn't apply. And one of the things we're getting here a lot in the US is people struggling with how the political situation here has shaken out. People are freaked out and nobody's talking, half the country isn't talking to the other half of the country. And people are, um, you know, unfriending people on Facebook because they can't even, they don't even want to talk to them anymore because they're on the different a different side of the political line, and 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 so that's that's one of the things that I wanted to talk about is the fact that it's impossible principles the way that thought works it's it's behind everything it looks like um, it looks like it's possible to have a different kind of a problem. And to the degree that people feel like there's problems other than thought problems, they're going to be stuck. Um, they're, they're going to be stuck for a lot longer if they feel like there's, that it works a different way in that part of their life. Because what they're going to be trying to do is fixing the problem. So what, what this looks like in, in a practical terms is um, there's, there's a lot of people that are that we see that are coaches or that want to be coaches that want to be doing this work and they're trying to make decisions about how that should look and they can't get any clarity. They just have a bunch of insecurity about, I'm not ready to do that. I, I'm, you know, what if I'm not ready? What if isn't this isn't the right time? It's a big move. So they're looking for answers and clarity about some big decisions, but they can't get any clarity because all they have when they look is fear and, uptightness you know they just get really tight instantly and and that's 
the, the problem is, is that what people are, you know, when people have some big area that they're struggling with, they bring all of their tension into that process of thinking about it. And then they look for answers and they're like, well, the principles aren't working. I can't get answers. There's no answer to this problem. And, 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 and the problem is, is that people don't have enough of the faith that it has to be a, a problem of thought. It's, it's impossible. It has to be a problem of thought. It has to be something, the only answer that's going to happen is something that happens inside of you. What people try to do is figure out what the right answer is so that they can feel better so that they don't have that tension. And what I'm saying is, well, you're not gonna feel better until, until something inside of you changes, whether the problem is, whether the problem has changed or not. And that's one of the problems that this client I'm, I'm doing um, coaching with her, she's taking our online course and I'm doing coaching with her. She's, she signed up to get help because of what was going on in politics and she can't, she's just so um, disheartened about humanity and about her future. And, and her problem is that she is bringing that. It doesn't look, it looks like there's a problem with our country and our humanity and who can have peace of mind there. And so, and so that's kind of what inspired this. And so one of the things that is interesting about people is that if you, if you look out at, the things that you have changed about up until now, if you look back on the moments where you were up against something big and, and, and significant and you got past it, you rose above it, you, something shifted, you forgave something or you um, were able to just come to terms with the way something was, you let something go or you just got behind a decision and went for it. That happened because of something in you, because you saw a different angle, not because the problem changed. And in a sense, that, that's, that's how problems change. That's how problems, that's how we get peace of mind. That's how we get, that's how we come to decisions. It's not because the decision gets more clear, we have more information but because we decide I'm just going to do this and then you do it and then you work out the details, but without the faith that you're the one complicating it, you don't get the peace of mind. And, and that's, that's what happens for people is people essentially look, they look at a problem with all of their tension and anxiety and then they try to figure out what to do which is really the worst state you could possibly be in when you're thinking about decisions, when you're thinking about the state of politics or whatever torments you and looking for answers, you're not going to find them because of the, the design, because of nature, because of the way that thought works. It's, it's like looking for your glasses. You ever look for your glasses and you're wearing your glasses. I don't know if you've ever done that, but you're, I've, I've had my, my sunglasses on top of my head, you know, up here, and I'm looking for them. I've done this several times, actually. Well, you're never going to find them, ever, until you realize that they're on your head, or, you know, usually someone tells me. But that's the perfect metaphor for what happens when people try to find peace of mind outside of themselves by fixing the problem or, um, you know, making decisions so that they can feel better. You're not, it doesn't work that way. It's a, anything that has a, any, anything that we're up against is that, that, that where we live in a state of tension or anxiety or pressure to make a decision, it's the pressure that's a problem. It's not that the decisions are hard or that they're significant. 
is that you're feeling pressure. And the, the problem is that the people, like the people that are trying to make deci career decisions and feel like, well, this decision really matters. So where I go from here is gonna decide the rest of my life. I have to pick the right one. Once I leave this job, then I'm not gonna have any income. This is a really big deal. Those thoughts are creating more problems. So for them, they're looking for the right answer and without really having all the information about which one is gonna work out, you don't get to have that. And in a sense, trying to solve a problem by um, thinking about the content of the problem is like looking for your glasses when you're wearing them. The answer does not exist out there. You can't, you can't possibly find them because you're bringing the tension to that situation. So it's, it's contaminated. And, and that's, that's one of the things that happened actually in this um, phone call. One of, my, one of my phone calls with this woman who's freaked out about politics, so she got off Facebook and she, she just stopped talking to people about politics. She's kind of, you know, holed up in her house. She doesn't bring it up anymore. She just can't think about it because it's too upsetting. And, and so we're talking and she's in... She said, I just don't, you know, I think it would be um, until it looks like there's some common sense in my country, I just can't be around these people. It's basically what she said. And it was interesting because she's somebody who had had, who's had panic attacks for the last 10 or 12 years. In fact, she, she's doing um, coaching in our online course because she can't come out here because she's, she's afraid of having a panic attack. And she said, you know, it's so interesting because she, she had a panic attack um, two or three days before our, our, just a few days ago, we talked yesterday. And she said, you know, it's so interesting because I stopped asking myself why I was gonna have, why I'm having panic attacks. And she stopped worrying about the next panic attack. And what happened is she, she had this, she had a panic attack. She's in a grocery store and she said, I, it was the strangest thing because I just was kind of like, okay, this is happening. And so she's in Safeway and she goes over to the wine section where it's quieter and she's just kind of hanging out, having this kind of, you know, experience over there in the corner of the store. And she said it was really interesting because it, it kind of stuck with me. It came to a head, but it didn't go anywhere. And I ended up just standing there kind of just watching people and trying to keep it together and wondering if I should call my husband to have me pick me up. And I thought, well, let me just see where this goes. And she said it was interesting because it died down to a level where she could check out, buy her things, leave the store and go home. And she said, I had this feeling of tension, but it didn't go anywhere. It just was unpleasant. And it was unpleasant for a few hours, but that was it. And she said, the one thing that changed is that I wasn't adding on to it by trying to figure out why I'm having panic attack and panic attacks and how to get rid of them. And that's, that was a shift in her where she was not bringing a level of anxiety, what was going on, an extra level of anxiety. That's really the problem with panic attacks is not the panic attacks, but people's fear about where it's going to go and how terrible, you know, what it's going to do to them. They're essentially fearing future panic attacks, worrying about panic attacks in between the panic attacks. And so they're, they're building attention. And when they have them, they're worried about how bad it's going to be and what's going to happen. And she going to make a scene. She's embarrassed. So this all, you, you take the kind of meaning out of it and the, all the extra stuff people do on top of what they go through. And it just looks like, okay, so this is happening. She said, you know, it was, I could handle it. I, I, it was, when you just take that moment, it's something I can handle. And that's what the areas that we're trying to fix, wherever, whatever areas people are trying to get help through the principles, whatever areas they're trying to get relief by 
you know, thinking about whatever it is, politics, decisions, is that relief may be in the form of just essentially being comfortable with the fact that our psychology is not um, under our control. And that's what this woman realized, is that you can't just use your free will to clear up or fix where you go about decisions or about panic attacks. Is there's, there's a part of it that's um, the things that we're tormented by. We're, those are thought problems and we don't necessarily get to, um, you can't just go in there and undo that. So there's a way in which people have to be comfortable with um, things they don't like. Essentially, they have to learn, people have to learn to be comfortable not knowing what's going to happen and not knowing why things are the way they are. In the same way this woman was got comfortable with, all right, I'm just, so I'm just having a panic attack. Apparently, I'm somebody who has panic attacks. She'd always thought of herself as kind of calm. And, and then all of a sudden, she hit 30 and this, she started having panic attacks. And she said it didn't start out as a problem, but it became a problem as she was like, wait a minute, am I going to start getting more scared as I get older? Is this like a new personality? Is this who I am? Am I going to start fearing life? And am I going to be one of those people that can't cross bridges and fly and go out? And that, there's a part of her that was feeling like I have to use my free will to clear up this part of my human condition. And that's one of the things that I, that's one of the things that inspired this talk is there's certain things that we have, there's a shift inside of us and all of a sudden we can let go of something somebody did to us. And we did that. We got free from that. But it doesn't mean you get to just do that whenever you want. It, it is where relief comes from, but there's a kind of a mysterious side of life that brings us these um, amazing moments of freedom and realization. And that's not really our department. Our department is in um, not making it worse and riding it out until we have those moments. But the having the insights and the making those happen and having the clarity and having the decisions come to us is not something we can force with our free will. In fact, the more you try to force it, the, the worse it gets. So this woman trying to think her way out of her panic attacks was, was made it worse. And that's what, but what, but what it means is that to, to whatever degree things scare us or frighten us or torment us, decisions we have to make or politi how politics, state of politics, we do have to be comfortable having things be messy and just have that be part of the landscape, which people don't like. I don't like it. I don't like having things that I don't, that, that are, that really matter to me, that I'm in a bad place about. I don't like that, especially when I know, well, if I'm in a good place, I'll handle this really well, and I really want to handle this well. That's, there's a part of our ego that says, oh, I can, I can get, um, I can be at my best about anything. Let me just get there mentally. Let me look for clarity and insight about this because I really need it. The problem is they go into that process really uptight. And, and that's the thing about the principles is that we have, we, we do have, there's a huge amount of power that we're connected to. We have a lot to do with how much we bring that into our life and into the parts of our lives where we struggle. But it can't be 
something that it's not something that you do it's something that you let in and that's the difference is a lot of the people that learn about the principles have either a self-help background or have the idea or, or um, you know, effective, really good at their jobs and they're really good at getting things done. And they're not used to not being able to get things done that matter. And in a way you have to, in life, you have to be comfortable being up against things that you have no idea how to handle. You're probably not handling it very well and not be able to have the kind of clarity that you need until, I don't know, maybe 10 years later. There's a lot of decisions that we've had to make that if we can, once we look back, we realize that wasn't, that wasn't a very good move. That was not a very good way to handle that. Or we realized we were holding a grudge about something that didn't, you know, it wasn't, that wasn't fair and it wasn't right. You don't, you don't always get those answers on your schedule. So it is something that happens inside of you, but you don't get to make that happen. And the more comfortable people are with just, well, I don't, I don't see what to do. And so this is how it's going to be until I see it. It's going to be messy and I'm not going to bring what I know I can bring to this because I just can't see how to get there. That's the kind of, there's a way in which you want to be going about life in a way that's in line with how mind works so that you're not thinking you can um, bully your way or strong arm your way through to clarity about something if the clarity is not there. A lot of times you just have to have life be messy until you can see how to do it different. And it, and it doesn't, and it means that you don't get to um, do everything right. And as long as you're okay with that, you're, you will find more and more benefit in the principles. One of the things that my, my son, I have a 15 year old and the other day I, he's, I had just sat down, um, I had my lunch and I just sat on the couch and I had my water and I had this little TV tray and I just got all set up. It was Saturday and I made this big lunch and I just sat down and I realized that I'd left something in the other room. And so my son was walking by and I said, oh, I left my phone in the other room and he's, you know, thinking maybe he'll go get it for me. And as he's walking through and he says, well, sounds like you have a me problem. Sounds like a me problem. And, and essentially, which is, I think, what his teachers say to him when he turns something in late, like, that's not my problem. That's, that's, that's it's not a you problem. It's a me problem. And he said, and I, 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 thought, I thought that was so funny because I could tell that he was kind of like, well, I'm not getting your phone. And I think that's, it's in, a, in the same way, I think people, Think about their, their problems that they have is a life problem. There's a problem outside of themselves. And to the degree that we see, you know what, this would not be a tough decision except the fact that I'm overthinking it. That's what a me problem looks like, right? You know, it's a, it's a problem of inside of the person. It's not a problem with life. And to the degree that we can see that, we're open to... Um, we're open to having things shift inside of us. When we feel like there's a problem in life outside of us, it feels very threatening and people get really tense and it looks like a life problem. And I'm saying all, all of my problems are a me problem. They may not look like it if somebody, you know, if, if, the fact that there's so much infighting in our country along political lines and the, the, the things that if I get into an argument with somebody, the, the areas where I'm struggling, I'm struggling because of a me problem. It looks like I'm struggling because I'm having to deal with this person or the politics in our country are messed up. But it's, 
it's not, um, that's not possible. Everything is a meat problem for me in my life. And, the, and I, I don't, so, so that I understand that that's where my answers are gonna come from. So my, all of the, all of the things that have changed for me in my life, all the relief that I've had and the, the way that the principles have helped me have helped me because something inside of me has shifted and I've seen something in a different way. And the, the areas where we get stuck and we can't make any headway, for me, it's because that does not look like a me problem. It looks like there's something wrong with life. And, the, and I'm bringing my, um, I feel threatened by it. And in that tension and that feeling of tightness and fear, I'm looking out at that problem and seeing an unsolvable problem. Like, like this woman looking at politics and people making decisions. So that's what, that's what makes a difference for people is, do they see that everything is a me problem? And do they see that it doesn't mean you get to just sprinkle some principles on there and fix it. Like we either have thoughts that, that shift us or we don't. And, the, and they're not on your schedule. But the relief you're going to get is going to come from you. Sometimes life cooperates and does what we want, but you know, that's rare, at least in the things that matter, right? This, this are you barking up the right tree? So most people are barking up the wrong tree. They're looking for, well, let me just analyze this and be really intense about it. And then once I fix it, well, then I'll relax. And 10 years down the line, you're still not liking the way that you are or your career choice. So, so that's, that's really what I'm saying is your, your free will. The best use of your free will is to be able to relax into whatever's happening until you see something different, which is a funny way to see free will. I know that's not what people had in mind. I think when they came up with the term, whoever coined that, but our free will is in our ability to either get ourselves in the way by, you know, analyzing and living in a state of tension or to get out of the way by rolling with whatever's happening until you see something different, getting out from under the impatience of, I got to see something different right now because this matters. That does not move things along. So that's the, that's the, those are the, in my mind, what it looks like to having the, seeing that thought is the only kind of problem you can possibly have. And it's not something that you can control. That's what I've learned about the principles that's helped me is knowing, um, you know, most of the time the problem is that I am getting in the way of progress so that I would otherwise just be rolling with whatever's happening and seeing what makes sense a lot sooner. My, my mind will evolve as I just relax into things. And it's when I feel like, no, I don't like this. I have to change it. Um, that intensity is where we tend to get into trouble. Any questions so far? Or any comments? Now, one of the, and, I'll, and you guys feel free to chime in anytime, but then I'll, I'll try to remember to stop periodically and ask again. But one of the things that I think is so interesting about people is that The things that, you know, if you look at somebody else's problem, if you switched heads with the person next to you and 
looked out at what they're struggling with in life, their problems, their answers look really obvious. And it doesn't to the, the person with the problem. But you know, when you look over, when somebody in your life is struggling with something, you don't necessarily say it, but you can tell, well, this is a really simple solution here. And a lot of times it's just the person has either overcomplicated it or doesn't really want to come to terms with, isn't, isn't really, uh, is in, in denial about some part of the equation. And so they're trying to, they're trying to resolve it when they really don't have all the information. And, and that's one of the things like I had, we had a client that was a school principal and she had moved from a middle, from a high school to an elementary school. So she'd been a high school principal for 20 something years and she'd just taken a job as an elementary school principal. And she wasn't getting along with anyone. She couldn't get along with the teachers. She was just at odds. And she said, you know, this school is a really closed culture. Like my last school, we were like a big family. We looked after each other. We liked each other. The parents, we kind of all felt like we were in it together. Well, this school, everyone's so, you know, it's really hard to get in with these people. And so, so we, you know, we, we happened to be able to talk to one of the other teachers from the school. And, and it was so interesting because she said, well, um, the principal of this school is very um, kind of dismissive and, uh, you know, does, it doesn't seem respectful of us. You know, she kind of just, she's not interested in our input. She just says, well, just do this. And so when parents come to her, she just says, you know, well, my, my son keeps missing the bus in the morning. Sometimes the bus comes early. She's like, well, you know, you can drive them that day, or maybe you need to get there a few minutes early. And she doesn't really, she just looks like she doesn't have time to deal with any of us. And it doesn't set well with the parents. People feel like they don't care. She doesn't care. Well, we talked to the principal, and the principal's basically saying, says, you know, I just can't believe how, you know, we said, well, do you like, the, you know, do you like the school and the people? And do you like your job so far? And she says, yeah, the only problem I have is that I can't believe how, petty people are. Their problems they have are so ridiculous and menial. It looks like these people have no lives. Where I went to, you know, in the high school, there's real problems there. There's violence and bullying. And these people are talking about missing buses. Like, I just can't, these aren't real problems. Like, let me deal with the real, pro where's the real problems? I don't have time to talk to you. I get it. There's, show me a real problem and I'll sit down and talk to you. And, and, and basically what she hadn't realized is she, I mean, it makes sense if you're in her shoes, but you know, she's missing the fact that, you know, to a parent, their problem is really big to them. And it's as big as if their kid is getting bullying, bullied. That's, that's, she's, she's essentially, being dismissive of everybody else's problems in the same way that when we look at our other friends problems we're like that's not a problem take a look at my life this this is a problem i have real problems your problems i could fix in 15 minutes just give me a pen and some paper but that's so interesting is until the principal in fact it was just in having the conversation about how petty people were she said, i'm used to real problems she's like I guess if I, I don't know what kind of problems they could have at an elementary school that I would think was worth sitting down and giving them more than two minutes of my time. So I guess, you know, maybe this isn't a good fit for me. And, and then she came back the next morning and said, you know, I just realized that I, I really don't understand. I'm, I, I'm just used to, I'm used to a, a certain um, kind of problem and these don't look like problems to me but I remember when I was in elementary school and my daughter felt like her teacher didn't have time to talk to but I didn't feel like when my kids were in elementary school 
And my teacher didn't feel like she had time to talk to my daughter. My daughter was scared to ask her questions because she was kind of impatient. That was a really big deal to me. And, and she, part of the problem she was missing was her part. But before she, what she brought to work with her every day was what menial problem are you going to bring me today? Or how is this, is this problem significant enough to be worth my time? Is this what I should be doing with my time? And it was, she, in her own way, discovered, oh, this is a me problem. And she had to, it took her, it took her a while to learn how to have that reaction, get over it, apologize, go back to the person and say, no, no, tell me again. Or she had to really kind of, look at it from another angle until she could see some a level of respect and see them through new eyes. And it took her a long time and it made her job a lot harder because she, her first reaction was kind of wanting to roll her eyes and see what else was on her schedule. And that's what, the, that's the, that shift is what I'm pointing to in the principles for people is you're looking for, if I, but for the thoughts that I have, this would not look like a problem. Rather than, let me fix this problem so I have a different set of thoughts. That's what she was saying. Is she, she was questioning, well, maybe I should go back to being in a high school. And I said, well, you, I mean, you could. I don't care what you do. But, but honestly, you know, I'm guessing that if you cop an attitude about people that don't line up with your value system, it's probably, you know, probably be a nice thing for you. You know, maybe this is a, you know, a, a growing, a growth opportunity for you. I'm guessing that's a problem in other areas of your life, you know? And she said, well, actually, that's exactly why my husband and I got divorced because he felt like I was dismissive and she was the career woman and he stayed home with the kids and she was kind of, she was a little dismissive of him. Well, you can find the time to do these things. She was, that was her thing was getting dismissive and feeling like people are, are out to lunch or don't, or their problems are less significant than hers. And that's what happened is she realized, I need to see something about this. I don't want to feel that feeling of being disgusted by people or wanting to roll my eyes, that's a me problem. It's not that I'm in the presence of people who are, you know, have trivial problems. It's because I have a thing about what makes, you know, what's legitimate in life and what isn't. I'm arrogant, basically, is what she realized. She said, I want to stay at this school and I want to, I want to, learn how to be respectful of people and how to feel close to people instead of looking for reasons to be condescending, which is basically what would happen as soon as she sat down with someone. How is this person, you know, um, missing the boat? And that's what, it, that's what it looks like for us. The times that we've had a shift is we've there's something's changed in us because we've looked at things fresh. And we've looked at things not, we're not thinking about the problem itself. We're, we're looking at where we're coming from about that. And if you're interested at all, even 1% of you is interested in where you're coming from, never mind how messy the problem then time is on your side because if you're chronically uptight about something or scared about something, even if it's something like panic attacks, you should be able to look and see, I'm freaked out. I'm not even having a panic attack and I'm freaked out. That's the problem. If you're interested in seeing that your fear is the problem or the way that you're, you're what you bring to that, where you're coming from when you look at that problem, that will look like a much bigger problem than whatever it is you're dealing with is all of the intensity you bring to it is contaminating whatever you're up against. 
Is this making sense so far to you guys? Any questions or comments so far? One of the things that um, keeps coming up for me as you're talking is um, when I had the realization, when I first learned the three principles, it was all about me and learning and how it affected me. And then at some point, I had the realization that, oh, wait a minute, everybody operates like this. So this person I might be having a problem with is also operating like this. And so they're living in their thinking and it's not just me living in my thinking, you know, that it's, it's all of us operating that way. Right. Well, you know, it's, it's funny. I talked to a guy, we have a couple coming out here next week that, um, the, the wife had had an affair. The, the, they both had these very intense careers and, the, and they kind of just got, just over the course of time, had kind of gotten disconnected and spent more time with the people at work than they did with each other. And then pretty soon they preferred the people at work. And, um, and anyway, she ended up having an affair. And then she was afraid that she was gonna have, um, <laughs> she was afraid the affair had happened 10 years before, 10 years ago, but she was afraid that she was going to um, have Alzheimer's and mention it when she got older. So she didn't want to have any secrets. So she told him, she said, it, you know, it's not, wasn't, didn't turn into anything, you know, but she told him, well, he got really angry. And I mean, it was understandable. He kind of was calling completely caught off guard because he felt like oh, I didn't, I didn't realize we were that bad. And he got in this kind of really mad at her. And then he got kind of, um, what are we going to do about this? We have to, you know, we can't, this can't be it. We can't, he, he just, he got really freaked out about the state of their relationship, really wanted to keep it together. And, and what made sense to him at the time was, I'm going to resent her for the rest of my life unless I cheat and even the score. So he did. And then he felt really guilty and he blamed her for the resentment. And then he blamed her for the guilt. He blamed her for the fact that he had an affair. He just, the whole, um, it just compounded the problem. And in his mind, he pinned it all on her. It was so interesting because, and, and so they're, they're coming out. And, and so when I'm talking to him, he basically is talking about her and complaining and giving me kind of a, you know, building a case. And, and in the beginning, he's basically saying, we're just coming out here because of what she did. And, you know, she needs to realize how much she's affected us. And so interesting because in the last, you know, I'm just listening and asking questions in the last, three minutes of the call right before we get off the phone, he says, I said, so what are you looking for? Are you just coming up here to accompany her or is there something you want? And he said, I just realized that I don't let things go. And um, that's, you know, even if we didn't have affairs, I don't, I just, I can see a lifetime of me resenting her for everything she had done before that, but now all of this added on to it. Like, I need some help forgiving her for all of her atrocities because I don't want to live like this. It was so interesting because he basically, in those couple of minutes, said, well, there's what she did, but there's where I go with it. And I'm just as much, it turns out, now that I'm describing myself, I was like this before she had the affair. I'm pretty sure I'm just as much of a mess as she is. Even though she did all these things, I don't let things go. I don't let things go that my kids said. I don't let things go that my brother did. He works with his brother. And, and that's what, a lot of what helps us forgive people is realizing that even though we're playing by all the rules that we've made up, we're we're all human and even though we can't see our own messiness 
we're just as messy as everybody else. The people around us, the people that we've been able to forgive. We've been able to forgive because we can see well, we have some part in it or there's a good side of them. We, we are able to see something other than they're bad and I'm good. And that's what it, it takes a different angle. It takes the getting off the they're bad and I'm good. It takes the being interested in what else am I missing? And when we forgive people, it's either what we see is, you know what, they didn't mean it or they couldn't help it or this isn't personal. We see something about them, another angle of them, or so we see another angle of ourselves, like, oh, I'm no picnic. That's what this guy saw. And you don't have to know what you're looking for, but you know if you have a bad attitude about another person or you're freaked out about something. It's some, the relief we get from that comes from seeing a different angle. And you don't have to come up with what that angle is. You don't have to positive think your way into a better feeling about somebody. You just have to be interested in the fact that there's something different for you to see and be interested in what else it would look like if you weren't looking at it through the eyes that you're looking at it through now. That's what, that's what happened for this guy is he came into it with kind of riveted to she did all of these things. And when I asked him, well, are you looking for something for yourself? He looked and he said, well, actually, I'm kind of a mess. It does your free for him. His free will was, and let me get off of the, you know, life is the problem for just a moment and look inside myself. And what he saw inside of himself was a huge amount of resentment before that had, affair had even happened. And that's what I'm saying is that the amazing part of our psychology is that if you're interested in what thought has to do with what's going on, you'll see it because it has everything to do with what's going on. If you're interested in what, how is this, the fact that what you're going through is thought and not how difficult the problem is, you'll see it. In the same way that if you are mad at someone and you stop looking at what they did and you look inside of you to whether you have a part in it, you'll see, I'm mad. I'm holding a grudge. I'm having really bad thoughts about them. I'm only seeing the bad or I'm, I'm not looking at the context of the situation. So thought, well, you're, if you get open to what else could this, you know, what's this, is the source of the problem really life? Or is the source of the problem my intensity and my uptightness? If you look inside, you'll see, oh, there's intensity and uptightness. And then it looks like something you actually have some influence over. It's a, it's a relief to people to see, oh, I'm really worked up about this. Of course I can't see anything new. It doesn't mean that you all of a sudden are relaxed and easygoing about it. But at least you know the biggest problem for you is within your jurisdiction. So you don't have to wait for life to change or decisions to happen. You could have a new thought and feel differently in 10 minutes tomorrow and see this set of decisions in a way that's much more simple, has much less of a charge to it. Any other questions before I wrap up here in a few minutes? You know, one of the things that I, I love about um, the work, the, this kind of work and the particular kind of clients that we see is we have about half the people we see that come out here or do our courses are people who are really struggle on a clinical level. They, they're depressed or they have PTSD or, and then the other half are these um, really high functioning business clients. They're running companies and, you know, managing 
um, you know, giant business areas. So what's interesting is that, um, you know, everybody has, they all have the same problem. And, and that's, you know, one of the, one of the guys that I had out here last year is this um, CEO and his wife was really, really troubled and had just had a hard time getting out of bed in the mornings. And he said, you know, I don't really know what the, what the big deal is. Like you just get up and you get dressed. You just go about your day. Like, well, how is that hard? It's like the easiest thing you have to do in a day. It's the only thing that's easy. The rest of it is hard. He was kind of, couldn't imagine why that was so hard. And then he realized, you know, it's funny because when I first started, the first part of my career was really hard because he couldn't make decisions. Every dis he overthought every decision because he didn't want to make a bad one and then have to, and then regret it. And he said, it's funny because when I develop people, you know, I take on interns sometimes and I develop people that I know have a specific skill and they just have no business sense. Um, I see myself in them. I realize how far I've come because now I, I make decisions all day and a lot of them are really big decisions and I just do a little bit of research and then I just shoot from the hip and I pick one. And I know if it's the wrong one because it explodes and I have to clean it up. And, but half my decisions are bad, you know, turn out to be not the right decision. And that's not a big deal to me. And I remember when I see these, you know, younger people coming up, I used to be intense about decisions because it looked like there were right decisions and wrong decisions and you better pick the right one. And, and he said, that's so funny because that's exactly my wife's problem is that she is overthinking things so much that it just getting out of bed and putting on her robe is hard to do. And that's how I was. And I'm realizing that, you know, we don't, for, for somebody, for somebody in his position where his decisions have a lot bigger implications, it's surprising how easy he makes those decisions. And that was a vision for his, that's, that's what his wife saw. She said, you know, what's at stake in his decisions in a day-to-day -day is so much bigger than mine. It's inspiring in a way. Because I, I, I feel like, well, I don't know, he makes decisions that loses him a lot of money and he has a family to take care of and all of our savings is tied up in this company. And, and that's, that's what, I think people forget about themselves when they live in fear about something, about a decision we have to make, is that every day we're making really big decisions. And in our lifetime, we've had to make decisions that, that seem very pivotal and significant, or pivotal and significant, and yet we would just kind of pick one and go with it and you know, clean it up later if we have to. The only reason that the ones that we get stuck now is because of the overthinking part of it and the fear that it might not work out. And that's the part of it that I love about the principles because if you look at your life and how decisions don't have to look scary or the fact that people can come to terms with any political situation, people living in much worse political situations than we're in here in the States and um, that are that are just living in, you know, with the era of the internet, you get to see what other conditions other people are living in and it's horrifying. And yet, you know, I talked to one of those people at one of the conferences I went to. It's so funny. She's just, we're just having regular conversations. She's not traumatized by, you know, um, what she's up against there. Like they don't have food. They get cut off from food and water. They don't have medical supplies for weeks at a time. And I think, well, she's fine. It's just, that's one of the things about the principles is that we've been up against things much bigger than what we're up against. And we've, we have found whatever peace of mind and resolve we need, even though it's a mess. And that ability is, within us. And if that's where we're using our free will, well, it, it'll work. If you're trying to use your free will to get 
you know, um, to figure something out to fix a problem, it's it's not going to work because it doesn't work that way. The only the only the only ability we have in our free will is to is to find a different feeling within ourself and to know that's what's going to change here. And and I don't overthinking things and trying to um, trying to fix a problem from a state of intensity will, will never work. And that's what this, essentially this husband was seeing is, well, if you get intense about something, of course it's gonna be a hard decision. And I'm making really hard decisions now. They don't feel hard. It looks like a, it looks like a toss up. So our lives, if we switched heads with the person next to us, our lives, if you looked at somebody else's life and their decisions, you'd just, well, I don't know, I'll, you'd look into each thing, you'd make a decision. If you had some horrible situation you had to face, you'd just, you know, you'd have whatever influence you could have and then you'd just suck it up and deal with the rest and it would just be part of the landscape. It just looks like what we're up against is something different and that it's not possible to have kind of free will and, and be comfortable with the kind of struggle that we're up against. Well, thank you guys so much for listening. I, um, you guys can go, we, we do, um, in the same way that the 3PGC puts out free content. Um, if you guys are interested, you could go to our website. We put out about every two weeks or so. We'll put out little kind of mini versions of this on whatever topics people seem to be interested in. Um, you can go sign up for our list. We have um, an online course called the Insight Course. That's, that's a, a, basically a, a bumper to bumper presentation on the principles through um, videos and animation. And that's um, just fantastic. So you can take that uh, if you're interested in distance learning. We have four day programs. You can come out to LaConnor, spend four days out here. Um, otherwise, I will um, see you guys in the next webinar that we do. And um, thank you so much for your attention and your interest. Thank and you. I, yeah, thank you for thank you for setting this up. You are very welcome. Thank you for um, for the talk. It was really fabulous. And just for anybody who's listening afterwards, if you go under the YouTube video, I'll post information on the website so that they know how to get get to your website and sign up for your newsletter. And, um, and I highly recommend it. I, I read it every time it comes out. And I also just wanted to um, tell everyone that the next webinar is on December 27th with Francesco Barbera. Yeah, and then um, in January, our first webinar is January 12th with Elsie Spittle. So I hope to see everybody on live and, um, and thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks a lot, you guys. Oh, and happy holidays, everyone.